Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this wonderful webinar on this frigid day. I'm so happy to um, be with you where you can stay nice and warm and toasty and enjoy what I hope will be a journey through time and art. Uh, I am Beth Leventhal. I'm the executive director of the Hofstra University Museum. I've been here since 2006. It's been quite an, an enjoyable journey. Uh, prior to my tenure here, I was executive director at the Heckscher Museum of Art in Huntington for about six and a half years and actually a 12-year tenure there because my passion is art and education and for many years I was director of education and public programs prior to becoming executive director director. What I love is to take people on journeys of learning and we've created programs here at Hofstra that do just that. For seniors in our community we offer a monthly global explorations where we will take objects from our collections out and on the third Friday of each month from 2 to 3 p.m. you can explore wonderful objects from the cultures of our world and learn wonderful connective links between those cultures um, past and the cultures that we currently live in around the world. So today I'm hoping that you will enjoy this journey with me. We're going to start um, talking a little bit about the core mission of the museum here at Hofstra. Uh, I think it's an important place for our community, uh, one that perhaps people haven't been as familiar with over the years, but we have a long 50-year tradition. Our recent mission, which we created in 2013, is that we are integral to the academic mission of Hofstra University, teaching students and integrating with faculty in the teaching of their course, courses, but most importantly also reaching out to our community of learners throughout Long Island. And the museum does this by advancing knowledge and understanding through experiences with authentic works of art from the world's diverse cultures. We're very fortunate that the collection at this university museum allows us to do that and we'll learn a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. The museum is uh, part of a long tradition of museums and one of the things I've talked about with people in the past is the history of museums and the rise of museums in Western civilization. They come from a very ancient tradition which actually started in Asia and then in the Middle East um, before uh, the birth of Christ, very, very long time ago, um, stemming from an age-old desire, human desire, to preserve our cultural identity, regardless of what our culture is, to gain uh, an understanding of our society, of the politics of our time, and um, to increase economic status. Uh, if Museums have traditionally and always been places of learning and places that have more often than not been free and offering opportunities for individuals from every walk of life to come in and to learn from the objects of the past and to make connective links to their present. And with that in mind, today I believe more than ever Museums are an integral part of the foundation of our civic life. They help us understand each other and certainly in this changing global society where young people in particular will be working and living or um, in different cultures and communicating with neighbors from all around the world. It's important for us to have a better understanding of our past, of the present, of ourselves. And we do this by looking at works of art and artifacts from the past and uh, objects that are being created in our present to allow us to understand the challenges that confront us. Artists are known for a tradition of responding to the times in which they live, to the issues that confront them in their cultures. And it's through their works that we gain insight, certainly, into those cultures. And so we have these lessons that they've taught us about our shared history. And many believe, and obviously I believe as well, that museums are the cornerstone of learning and inspiration 
for all ages, people across every learning group. I call it lifelong and life-wide learning. At the heart of almost every museum, uh, collecting museums, of course, are their collections. And those are what define the educational mission and the intellectual content that a museum can offer to the community. So the objects in the museum's collection are such valuable, remarkable resources for us to gain knowledge and understanding. And certainly at Hofstra University's museum, it's knowledge and understanding about humanity, about our natural world, about our history, and about um, certainly artistic technique and mediums that have been used for, from the ancient to the contemporary. This collection is unique. We have more than 5,000 objects that have been gifted primarily to the museum. Very few of our objects have been actually purchased for us. And we represent the cultures on six continents of the world, dating from 5,000 BCE, before the Common Era, as we call it now, to contemporary times. We use our collections, we hope <laughs> we're using them uh, well to introduce people to the cultures of Africa and Asia, Oceania, pre-Columbian uh, era and culture, as well as European and American uh, artists and works of art. And we hope that we're taking people on journeys of discovery that are personal discovery uh, journeys that will lead to true insight and understanding about the rich diversity of our world, our cultures, and humankind's output artistically from uh, what we are able to say from 5000 BCE to the present. Today we're going to start our journey together, I hope, um, by a trip to China. We're going to explore various cultures around the globe and it's going to be a whirlwind trip, I, I have to say, as we're going to view a small selection of works from the museum's collections and weave the varied strands of a story uh, together that take us from culture to culture, looking at uh, cultural influences in terms of religion, history, and traditions. And we're going to highlight different artistic mediums that have been used, as well as techniques, in taking us on that journey. So we're going to start, as I've said, in China on the continent of Asia. We're going to have stops in New Guinea, uh, Africa, the Middle East, as well as a little hiatus into Europe uh, before we come to Mexico and then our final destination, North America and the United States. So here you see our very first work. This is called Equestrian. It's an official playing a musical instrument. It's from the Su and Tang dynasty, which is 7th century China. And just a little bit about how we come to even know about these artifacts um, and what they were meaning in this culture. The practice of placing ceramic sculptures, and this certainly is a ceramic piece, um, into tombs arose in 300 BCE. Uh, and it was in response to a change in Chinese beliefs concerning society and the afterlife. The figures and animals uh, that were used may have been, fortunately, uh, substitutes for sacrificial victims. And the sculptures certainly symbolized a belief in the deceased's continuing existence in the afterlife. And also, it was emblematic of their um, continuing and maintaining a social status in the afterlife, whether they had had military power and or uh, needed protection in the afterlife. These figures were developed to assist them, assist them with that in the afterlife. And it's very interesting that during the last 60 years, there's been a tremendous amount of scientifically controlled archaeological uh, digs that have taken place in investigation in China. And these digs have resulted in remarkable discoveries of many tombs. Uh, and the rich and varied resources and contents in those tombs have provided us with 
fabulous information concerning the lives of the ancient Chinese people. The vast majority of the objects that have been unearthed during these digs have um, been three-dimensional objects that have been made out of bronze, stone, wood, and ceramics. To my mind, it is remarkable that a ceramic object basically made from clay would survive so many centuries and for us to be able to have those unearthed and then become part of our ability to share the uh, culture of such an ancient time with young people and uh, with, with our community is, is quite remarkable. This particular tomb sculpture, as I've said, is from the late Sioux and the uh, Tang Dynasty, early Tang Dynasties. And this was a time that saw dramatic changes in artistic and religious influences. And, uh, um, the works share some basic characteristics. This one is a pale and very translucent glaze that you can see on the molded figure. There are very delicate facial features that express the epitome of that times uh, of Asian beauty. And this equestrian figure, along with other equestrian figures of the time, for both male and females, exhibit a very restrained posture. And you can see there's the chunky body of the horse along with the curved tail. And if you can make it out, it's a very stylized mane. These are very representative of the type of features and figures that would have been found from this period. So that's our brief hiatus in China. We're going to move along now. This is a Jane Shrine that was created, uh, this piece, in 16, I'm sorry, 1464. And uh, this work is from India. We're also going to look at a work from Thailand. What I did here was to give you, obviously this is a poster. Uh, we created uh, a number of posters that we have around campus in a program that we call a diversity awareness project. And it allows students as they're walking to classes in different buildings or having lunch with friends in cafeterias to see some of the remarkable objects from around the world that um, give them information about those different cultures. In this case, uh, this is a Jain shrine reflective of the Jain community in Gurujat and South Rajasthan in Western India. And the Jain community followed um, a very ascetic and otherworldly religion, so that in expressing their um, spiritual devotion, they were creating many small shrines such as this. And in this case, this particular shrine is focused on the Tirankartha a figure that you can see in the very middle of this shrine. And the Tirankartha was a saint or a prophet who um, basically attain perfection in their religion and through perfection was um, awarded absolute freedom. There's an absence of clothing and the adornment and this ascetic-ness, this um, taking away of material objects and uh, is part of the Jain doctrine. And it stresses this sense of supreme detachment for all human values and possessions. There's a very rigid symmetry to this piece as you look at each side of the shrine is very balanced um, and it's purposely done so. The uh, object, the Tarankartha in the middle itself has these very large arms and powerful arms that are an expression of a very idealized physique. And if you can make it out, you can see that the Tarankartha is seated in a meditation pose. And uh, it's on a cushion that is supported by lions and elephants are in a canopy right above the figure. There are also, very small to make out, but surrounding this figure are 23 additional Tirankartha figures, or they're called yakshas, which are male godlings. And they're there as devotees of this major Tirankartha god figure. There's also an interesting inscription on the back of this work, which says, on the 13th of the bright half of the moon, Jestha. 
and it refers to the Jain calendar. Um, there's a period of time called the Vikram Samvat era, and that began that era in 57 BCE. So it's a it's a quite a remarkable work. It's in beautiful condition, and it's wonderful for us to be able to share. The next work is Ahead of Buddha from the uh, around the 16th century in Thailand. We use this piece quite frequently, especially with children in our Art Travelers Through Time, uh, Literacy and History Through Art program. It's exciting to learn the about Buddha and the myths surrounding uh, Buddha. But uh, Buddhism was founded by um, Siddhartha Gautama around 563 to 480 BCE. He was an Indian philosopher who became known uh, as Buddha or enlightened one. In the Thai people who emigrated from southern China to uh, in the 11th century adopted Buddhism as their religion and began a sculptural tradition that relied heavily um, on the influences actually of India and other cultures. There were uh, many monks who were actually artists but there were also lay artists who were anonymous and so many of these works that um, exist are um, not known who the artist actually was. But their works are quite important to us as they give us a sense of the physical image of what uh, Buddha would have looked like. And these works were used quite heavily for Buddhist meditation. In this bust, we're seeing an example of the Thai ideal of Buddha. And if you notice at the top of the head, there are these snail shell curls that surround the top of Buddha's head. And there's a top knot at the very top there, which is called a Ushnisha. And that Ushnisha represents um, really brilliance and all knowledge and power. This piece also had what was thought to be a flame that came out of the top of the head, not an actual flame, but a, uh, a sandstone flame. And unfortunately, through time, it's broken off, and it could have broken off many centuries ago. We're thrilled to have this piece. This is as fine an example, we're told, as they have actually in the Met. Um, but it is an extraordinary uh, evidence of the culture of this period of time. From Thailand and India, we're now going to travel to Japan. Uh, currently in our David Filderman Gallery, and we have two galleries on campus, our Emily Lowe Gallery and our David Filderman Gallery. Uh, in the David Filderman Gallery through February 2nd, we have the Land of the Rising Sun, Art of Japan, and actually I'm going to show you this is a catalog from that exhibit. It's, it's quite outstanding works from our collection. We were just reviewed in the New York Times this uh, past Sunday and uh, talking about the treasures that we're sharing with the public from our collection. And uh, this is uh, Japanese art and culture certainly developed over many centuries and because Japan was an island for many years it was very isolated from other cultures. But incrementally over time, uh, starting about the mid-sixth century, um, China um, and India and Persia, through their contacts with China, started to trade with Japan. And the influences of their culture um, truly impacted the uh, visual arts of, China, of Japan as well as the religions. So where Shintoism has been a core religion in Japan for centuries, Buddhism became an equivalently important religion um, starting in the mid-sixth century in Japan. And what's interesting is that the core tenets of those two religions are very compatible. So um, this internal and external factors that we see both religiously and through trade routes really begin to influence the customs and the ideas that generate into the art of Japan. And a good example is this scroll that we're looking at from the 18th century because scroll, um, scrolls were actually a way that um, itinerant uh, 
religious individuals would carry the messages of Buddhism to different cultures and they were primarily written documents. The Japanese took that concept of the scroll and created a visual imagery to tell stories and to communicate information and this is done as we're saying, 1700s, this Habaku style horse is actually um, ink on a very fine but very um, well developed paper that is then attached to this beautiful cloth. Um, scroll and each piece of the scroll has a significance um, that is quite important. So it's this um, Japanese ink painting that we see conveying what is one of three very central themes that you will see in Japanese scrolls. Certainly animals are a very core theme, landscapes and as well as uh, contemplative landscapes um, and animals and uh, human beings are very important in scroll work as well. And we're very fortunate that this gift, along with several other scrolls that we have, were gifted by the Bear Company to, uh, family to the museum. Another aspect that we showcase in the exhibit are um, the wonderful woodblock prints that began to um, become very prominent in uh, between 1700, uh, or actually from 1650 to 1848, which was the Edo period in Japan. This one dates from sometime between uh, 1830 and 1831. And when you're um, looking at the works, the colors are just so brilliant. And Hokusai was a Japanese artist of renown who created, among many other series that he um, uh, developed, this series that is 36 views of Mount Fuji. And we have about seven different works by him in the exhibit and from this series. And each one shows a different aspect of Mount Fuji in the background. The colors, as I say, are brilliant. And in order to create these woodblock prints, and I'm sure, excuse me, many of you are familiar with the um, way that you create woodblock prints, every um, texture and color has to be done on a different woodblock. And then as you print, each layer is, has to be put together one on top of the next. It's a very intricate process and in the case of these woodblock prints you would have quite a number of people involved in the development of just one print from the artist who would create the concept to the engravers to the printers and uh, it's, it's a remarkable that they've stayed in such wonderful condition all these years. Certainly um, woodblock prints and we'll see another one here um, were very influential uh, as they were uh, travel became more prominent and deeply influenced quite a number of the artists in the um, in Europe, including Edgar Degas, uh, Henri Matisse, and certainly Vincent Van Gogh. And you can see just even in the way that the leaves are rendered, if you think of Van Gogh and some of the circular movements of his leaves in his work, there's a, a great sense of the influence there as well as the color. We now travel um, to Oceania and Malaysia. We're going back and forth in time looking at these works and in different cultures clearly works that come to us from uh, before the common era are very ancient. But in other civilizations where works of arts are handcrafted and used as tools and or in traditional ceremonies in a culture, works from the early 20th century or even the mid 20th century can be considered just as ancient and of value. Here we're seeing an ancestral board from Oceania. Um, it's a 20th century piece that's quite wonderful and it's carved most likely because it's, you can see it, it's a convex shape, um, when you see it in person, is out of the base of a canoe. And they would take these objects and use them in ceremonies. Uh, this case, an ancestral board, it's a society that honors its ancestors and 
Each year there are ceremonies that would utilize this uh, object as well as something like a Baba mask that we see here is woven out of fabric and it's using pigment and rattan uh, would be used in ceremonies to honor generations that have come before. And all the materials are local materials and they use um, sometimes coloration might come from lime or other um, uh, filaments that are found in the uh, communities themselves. Now travel across to Africa. Uh, while we have quite a number of remarkable works from Africa in our collection, I'm just going to share this one with you this morning. It's a Gelade mask, again a ceremonial mask. This is worn each year uh, in different ceremonies to welcome in the spring and uh, the fertile planting seasons in this community that's from Nigeria, Africa. Uh, this dates to the 1950s, but we have quite a number of works that come from the late 19th century, which is about as ancient as you're going to find works that are done, uh, whether they're in wood or um, pottery, from these nations in Africa. And we're able to share, in this case, it's the Yoruba people from southwest Nigeria that would have used this object. And you can see there's a lot, there are carry shells around the um, uh, middle portion of the gourd that has fiber and rattan as well as um, this wonderful wood that's been carved both on the bottom and the top of the piece showing different expressions and actually the wearers of these pieces each year might have added additional ornamentation and or carvings to give us more detail and to tell us more about who they actually were and what was significant to them um, as a year would have gone by. So they never signed their work but in a sense some of the works we have show the signature of the individuals who used and wore them by the very personalized objects that they placed on these. Um, sometimes fur, sometimes as I was saying, carry shells. And carry shells were very valuable um, and would be significant of the number of shells on a work would be very significant and letting us know about the status of that person in their society. So clearly the more shells, the more affluent and important a person would have been. We're going to take a step quite back in time. This is a work in our collection that dates to 1200 to 400 BCE. It's an iron work. It's a work of adornment uh, from the Persian Empire. And uh, it's quite remarkable that we have these pieces in our collection. This is uh, a work that would have been considered uh, an important piece. Uh, certainly decorative arts were a very important part of Persian art at this time. And this is one of those early works that's um, obviously very heavy, made out of iron. Uh, as they moved along in time, uh, to here we have 550 to 330 BCE. We're now into cast silver. And this is uh, a personal accessory as well, a fibula that would have been worn, almost as a pin would have been worn. Um, objects that would have been quite valued in this society would have been those personal accessories, pins, bracelets, were um, very high art forms for this time. Interesting, the two areas of art forms that were quite important to the society were either these very monumental structures that were created or these very personal objects of adornment. Well, we've certainly jumped quite forward in time <laughs> as we come to Europe, a brief stop in Europe on our sojourn uh, before we cross the Atlantic Ocean. And here we have a work uh, by Paul Gauguin in our collection. Uh, our collection of paintings isn't as robust as we might like. However, the paintings that we do have are quite wonderful uh, examples by artists including uh, Magritte, Picasso, Dali, uh, George Gross, 
Max Weber and numerous others uh, that are quite wonderful. And because of the quality of the works, they're quite often um, sought after for inclusion in international exhibitions uh, that uh, we're very honored to be able to participate in. Uh, this work is a very early work by uh, Paul Gauguin during his Impressionist period. Um, it was done somewhere between 1881 and 1882. And he actually didn't begin to uh, paint full time until 1883. So this is truly a very early work. You know, his early career was actually in the Merchant Marine and he was a stockbroker and banker before he turned full time to painting. And he was a, a real Real confidant of uh, Vincent van Gogh. They influenced each other uh, along with Bernard. Their threesome went, uh, would write to each other and share their ideas about art for many years. We think more frequently of Gauguin's work after he traveled to Tahiti and his whole ex style became so unique um, at that time. But because this is such an early work, it is such an important piece for us to gain insight and this wonderful portrait of a woman in that Impressionist style shows the uh, influence deeply of the Impressionists upon his work with the luminosity of color and that natural light and just the delicacy of her her um, features that he's captured. Um, this is a work that was featured uh, along with others in uh, an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2002 called The Lore of the Exotic, Gauguin in New, Co New uh, York Collections. So we were pleased um, to have that uh, participate at that time. This is a, another work of European art uh, by Konrad Felix Müller. Uh, Konrad Felix Müller was uh, very steeped in Expressionism early in his career. He was a very outspoken uh, artist during the time uh, when artists were creating works that were very um, important in pointing out uh, the issues at hand with the Weimar Republic and how uh, terrible a time that was for people in Europe. And this is uh, called Married Couple in Winter. I'm not even going to attempt to speak in German for you. <laughs> it was created in 1919 and um, he was very active um, very much so in communicating issues, uh, as I've said, of uh, in an expressionistic expressionistic uh, mode during this period of time. And uh, this particular painting uh, is one that is. Uh, quite outstanding in person. The colors are remarkable and the attitude of the people as they are um, surviving a winter in Germany during this time. He was one of the artists that stayed in Germany. Uh, it was not easy for him. Uh, the works we have by George Gross are quite compelling as well. And he fled Germany, actually, uh, Gross, in 1933. He was one step ahead of the uh, Nazi regime who had marked him for dead. And they actually had invaded his studio about a day and a half after he and his wife fled for New York. So um, he was very fortunate to get out and they destroyed quite a number of his works but he was able to roll up some of his canvases and, and bring them with him and uh, the reason I speak about uh, George Gross is because he had a very prominent role um, during my tenure at the Heckscher. I never met him. He passed away in 1959, but he actually was very active as a teacher offering classes at the Heckscher Museum of Art. He lived in Huntington and he worked and taught there for a number of years. Uh, we're now taking a step to um, ancient Mexico to the pre-Columbian era. This work dates from 100 BCE to 800 BCE, uh, BCE, the Common Era. It's a ceramic uh, bowl that was used in daily life. And uh, Dr. Lanik was very instrumental in gifting hundreds of works of pre-Columbian art to the Hofstra University Museum in the late 60s. Um, they have become the core of our collection. His daughter, Susanna, in the last few years has 
been gifting us additional works that are quite remarkable. Uh, it gives us insight certainly into the daily life of people from this era and uh, many of the works we have are rather small wonderful figurines and they are very um, symbolic of that period of time and they feature very wide smiling triangular shaped figured, uh, figures with outstretched arms and palms that um, were probably carried to um, funerals and um, used in death practices um, from what knowledge has uh, given us understanding about. And now we come to our final stops, which are the United States and artists um, in our collection. Very varied. I'm just going to give you a little brief insight. We have more than 2,000 objects of American art in the collection. It's probably the most predominant aspect of our collection from paintings, drawings, works on paper, um, prints, as well as sculptural works. And this is a, an artist that captures my attention, Alfred Maurer. He uh, born and raised in the United States. He, he worked in Paris for a number of years between 1897 and 1914. He was actually part of Gertrude Stein's circle and knew all the artists that would come to her um, salons and was deeply influenced, and you can see that influence here, by um, post-impressionism, impressionism, uh, uh, fauvism, and cubism, and all those elements seem to be very evident in this work. He uh, is considered by many to be the father of American and modernism. His work was so different, so unique. He re uh, returned to the United States at the dawn of the World War I and uh, gained great prominence both in uh, Europe and in America early uh, in those years. Just to give you a sense of additional works in our collection, we were very fortunate to receive, uh, at this point, more than 157 works by the artist Andy Warhol uh, in 2008, and just again this year, several more uh, prints have come to us. We have wonderful photographs uh, that are Polaroids, are very intimate uh, works that he had created taken and then would create, here we see Grace Jones who was quite popular in the 80s, and he would create his paintings based on many of these Polaroids. There's an Edward Weston that you're seeing from 1937, uh, uh, one of several works by Weston that we have in our collection. And then we're jumping to uh, Courier and Ives. We have more than a hundred works by Courier and Ives in the collection. This is a wonderful lithograph from the late 19th century. And then to bring you into the 21st century. We have this work by Stan Brodsky, who is one of Long, Long Island's own wonderful, renowned artists who um, just had a fabulous retrospective at the Heckscher Museum of Art. We did a, a retrospective of his work at the Hofstra Museum in 2008, and we now ha are honored to have several of his works in our collection. Well, this ends our brief sojourn through time. We've covered 32 centuries looking at 19 works of art. I wish we could have delved more deeply, but I certainly hope that you'll have an opportunity when the weather is warmer and to come to the museum and share some of our other works with us. And it's been my pleasure. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Meadow, do you have any questions? Yeah, the residents were asking, why do you use BCE and not BC when you talk about the works of art? It's a very good question. For so many years, BC was the norm, but about uh, Eight years ago, museums moved to saying before the Common Era, rather than denoting everything as before the birth of Christ, to be more global in the way that they speak about works of art, because there are so many different cultures that are represented, we go to a terminology that is before the Common Era and the Common Era, which is uh, basically uh, a time where there's more sharing of information. And East Northport, do you have a question? I'd like to know what is the monetary value of this uh, collection that what? you have at Asra? Um, monetary value. Yeah. Would you like to make a guess at what the value of our collection is? We have more than 5,000 objects, clearly. I would say 
over a million I dollars. I would say you're quite Probably yes. Ten million. Well, I'll let you know that we have. I won't tell you which work, but one work in our collection alone is worth more than three million dollars. Just one work. So we have five thousand objects. I couldn't even guesstimate, but I would say it's in the many hundreds of millions, if not more. Lynnbrook, uh, can, would you have a question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what do you think of the, the way that art has advanced in technology, such as graphics and digitals? I think that it's an important uh, move forward for us in art because, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, journey, art reflects the time in which the artists have lived. And certainly, we are in the age of technology. And to uh, not include that as an artistic art form would be uh, to ignore the fact that that is a crucial part of who we are as individuals. So it's going to be more and more, I think, a, a dominant aspect of how how artists uh, relate to the times in which they live. And an interesting, very quickly, um, in September we'll be having an exhibit of ancient Asian art. Uh, at the same time we'll be showcasing in our, two, one gallery will be ancient art, the other will be contemporary Asian art. And there are quite a number of works that will look at the past through contemporary uh, technology, as well as works by Ai Weiwei and others who are using traditional means to look at contemporary society. So it's a great question. Massapequa, do you have any questions? Yes, we do. We would like to know if when we come visit, can we ask for certain artworks to be on display? We are, with advance notice, we're always happy to bring up specific works for people to look at. But as our gallery space is limited, we can't bring in up too many. Uh, but we are also welcome people to come to that uh, program on the third Friday of each month, uh, February through um, August, uh, and we bring up about 25 or more objects from the different cultures of our collection each um, each month. So it's a great way to see quite a number of works, and you're all welcome to come. New Jersey, do you have any questions? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. One of our residents wants to know what were those accessories used for, the ones from the ancient days? They they were actually used for personal adornment, for people to wear and show off their prestige in society. Um, I can't imagine wearing an iron fibula. <laughs> uh, that must have been quite heavy, but apparently it was what they had as a, um, they hadn't really forged with silver yet uh, at that time. But it was you. Those objects were used for personal adornment, so they might have worn it around their neck or on their arms. I have a question here: um, How has technology helped people to appreciate art? That's another wonderful question. Uh, technology is a means for art to be accessible to people around the globe about works around the globe. By the uh, studying works on the internet, you can have access to uh, the world's riches just by going from museum to museum or art um, um, websites. We also at the Hofstra University Museum have quite a number of works that are uh, populating our uh, web pages and you can click on for more information on something called eHive, which is a free website that uh, is accessible through our website to see a growing uh, population of works and learn more about them. And technology has provided access in remarkable ways to the collections of our world. North Hills, do you have a question? Uh, I wanted to, we wanted to know, it's also a technology question, but have more people been able to be considered artists through the use of computers with the graphic designs and things of that sort? Or do you think the definition of an artist is still someone who uses their hands, whether it's making sculptures or paintings or anything of that sort? Well, I think as in anything else, things evolve with time and with 
technology. And there are artists who have made, had great renown using technology, yet they needed to have the fundamentals and learn the um, core of how to create art um, by the hand before they can make that transition. And I think a good example uh, would be someone like, um, oh my goodness, and I'm going to block on his name. He's such a famous artist who does remarkable work, and I had it, if I'm having a senior moment, um, who has uh, created remarkable works, but he was known as a visual artist of paintings prior to making the leap. Uh, even someone like Chuck Close, who um, uses uh, technology, is, was known first as a painter um, and, a, and for his drawings before his uh, uh, the works that he uses technologically have given him renown. Ai Weiwei is another uh, individual who incorporates, incorporates technology but also ceramics as a means for creating. So I think that there always will be this need for people to learn the fundamentals, but then how they translate it is what and how originally they translate something, whether it be through technology or not, is what defines them as an artist. And now it's time for us to, to end our explorations for today. It's been my pleasure to share with you. I wish you all a very warm and uh, restful rest of this day, and thank you so much. <laughs>